Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. And I hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. And here we are back at the top of the week, wading through all of the lies to try to make sense of this reality. Because without some kind of deeper understanding about all this stuff, it can drive you crazy, can't it? Living in sleep can drive you crazy. Now, it's a little crazy to be awake to the truth as well, but at least we have understanding and at least we know there's an end point to this and it will all be over soon, hopefully within all of our lifetimes. And we know that Jesus is the answer. So today we're here to talk about the Sandman. Now, the age old question, who is the Sandman? We've all heard the Metallica song, Enter Sandman, haven't we? Enter night, exit light in the lyrics to that song. All about the Sandman coming in with his nightmares to terrorize children. Well, in fact, the Sandman has long been associated with the dream world. In folklore, it is a figure that brings sleep and dreams by sprinkling magical sand into people's eyes. The Sandman also brings death. How does he do that? Through the passage of time. And that is where our study on the new TV series, The Sandman, will begin. The passage of time. Now this makes sense because the devil says that time is on his side. Why? Because the devil is time. How can that be? Well, ever since the world fell, we grew old and we died. Why? Because sin entered the world. And it says in the book of Genesis that because of sin, we all die. In other words, the timeline changed in this dimension. It changed to a timeline of decay. A timeline of death and renewal caused by sin. Now, Kronos is a variation of the Sandman, isn't he? Kronos is also the devil. Now, the hourglass, which holds the sands of time, looks like an Ouroboros. There's a couple different variations of this. This one goes in a circle around the hourglass, the sands of time, as you can see in this image. But the actual hourglass also resembles another variation of the Ouroboros, which is this snake eating its tail in the figure eight, which is also the infinity symbol. Now, make no mistake, the devil is trapped in this time loop with us, thrown down out of heaven. Heaven goes by a different timeline. Heaven has the timeline of infinity. What are we going to see in the Sandman series? Well, what you're going to see in these first two episodes is the actual trapping of the devil in the time loop. The Sandman literally gets trapped in a cage, in an hourglass shaped cage. So now that we've established who the Sandman is, let's get into this series, The Sandman. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of the backdrop of this series before we get into this montage, otherwise you're going to be lost. Sandman runs the dream world in the series. And in the waking world, a wizard, magician type, basically traps the Sandman underground for decades and decades. And what he wants from the Sandman is everlasting life. He wants all these gifts. He wants riches. And, he won't, and also he wants his son resurrected. But the Sandman refuses and it stays trapped in this, basically this dungeon inside of this magic circle. And at that point, 
Decades go by and finally the Sandman is released. And then we get the story of Cain and Abel. What does Cain and Abel have to do with the sands of time? Well, I'm going to show that to you later in this decode. Because Cain and Abel was all about the cursed sand. The cursed dust. Because after Cain killed his brother, the ground was cursed. It was the same soil that was cursed by Adam or it was cursed because of Adam and Eve's sin. Because Adam was cursed to basically toil in the sand and soil, wasn't he? According to the book of Genesis. But there was something deeper to the ground and the dust being cursed. Because remember, the dust was the creative material that God used. And so, in cursing the dust, what happens? Well, reproduction now dies. Have you ever made a cake out of bad eggs? You basically have to throw the cake out, don't you? Have you ever made cake out of bad milk or milk that's about to go bad? You have to throw the cake out. It, the cake will probably spoil faster. And that's kind of what happened to us. The original creative dust we were made out of was obviously meant to last forever. But because the dust was tainted and cursed because of sin, now we grow old and die prematurely, don't we? So that's the deeper story behind the cursed dust. Now let me go into the chat here and make sure you guys are with me. And we'll get into this montage today. This, I was not expecting to see what I saw in this series. It was a little deeper than I originally thought. Now, it opens with the acknowledgement about the Sandman and what he does. Let's play this here. He rules the dream world. Watch. No one must be allowed to fall asleep in his presence. No one. Or he will escape into your dreams. Or he will escape into your dreams. Now, they infer here that the dream world is actually the real world. Let me turn the volume down a little bit because that was a little bit loud for you guys. They infer that the real, the real world is the dream world. And vice versa. And I always wondered if what is in our dreams is real in another reality. Uh, many of you know that I've suffered from night terrors. I did in the past. They kind of quit when I started searching for truth back in 2012. And I went from night terrors every month to almost no night terrors in the past 10 years. And it's weird how dreams work because when you have a night terror, you're basically frozen. You're frozen in time, aren't you? You can't move. It's just almost as if your mind is somewhere else. And you're stuck between worlds. Now, if any of you have ever had a lucid dream where you're able to control your surroundings inside of your dream, in other words, you realize that you're in a dream, which is already very difficult to do. Most people, when they're dreaming, have no idea they're in the dream. It's like they're in some kind of alternate reality. And when you do realize you're in the dream, you can basically do whatever you want in your dream. You can create characters. You can fly. Now, it's only happened to me a few times in my life where I woke up inside of my dream and realized I was dreaming. And it was so real that I could do anything that I wanted. And then you find yourself longing to go back to that. Because it's like the perfect world, isn't it? But obviously we're not meant to stay there in that dream reality. But there's much more to dreams than meets the eye. We've talked a little bit about dreams on this channel. We've talked about how every single dream that's mentioned in the Bible is a foreshadowing of an event that had not happened yet. 
All you have to do is go onto one of these online Bibles and you can do a search for the word dream. And you'll see that every dream that's mentioned is a prophecy of something that had not happened yet. Now, are our current and modern dreams like that? Well, I don't know. Maybe they are to some degree if we only knew how to interpret the dream, right? So, the story opens with this guy trapping the Sandman in a spell circle. Now, we're not going to get into too much of the magic of all of this and how the magic works. I believe that this can be harmful to people. Um, if you dig into this stuff too much, if you start looking at sigils and all these things, we don't do that on this channel. We kind of give a basic overview of this, but understand that this is all very real. The Bible talks about seals and signs, seal of Solomon, the star of Remphan. These things are actually very real and they carry magic and power. So you shouldn't be delving into this stuff. Let's watch. You must construct a sphere of glass inside the circle to contain Dream's physical manifestation. So this is Dream. He's stuck in this magic circle that's on the ground and a sphere. So you have a circle above. I'm sorry. A circle below and a sphere above. And he's trapped in the dungeon. A spell circle. Now... Well, while he's trapped, apparently what they're trying to say here is that the Sandman, which also goes by Morpheus, that's his other name, uh, he's responsible for keeping balance in the dream world. And without him in his where he's supposed to be back in the dream world, chaos ensues and many, many people on the earth suffer from a sleeping sickness because the Sandman's trapped here. They basically are sleepy all the time and want to sleep and cannot wake up. Now, let's keep watching here. Now, there's an ally that shows up. And I don't, actually, let's go back to this part right here. This guy right here. Whoops. This guy right here, he shows up to the magician and he tells him that in order to keep him trapped inside this cage, that he has to build this sphere around him. That's the sphere you see here. And this really is the hourglass. I want you to look closely because you can't see it right here, but it literally is an as above, so below hourglass. Let's play this forward a little bit. You must construct a sphere of glass inside the circle to contain Dream's physical manifestation. You can kind of see it here. I'm going to zoom it up so you can see this. As it goes into the floor, you see that it is pretty much an hourglass, but it's partially buried into the ground. And so that's what the hourglass is, which we just established is the Ouroboros. Now, in this part, the Sandman's closest friend is a crow. And the crow tries to free him from the sphere, but he's shot right before his eyes. Because they feel like they cannot let the Sandman go, because if they do, the Sandman will kill them. So then... The guy who originally imprisoned the Sandman, he dies, leaving his son, which is the guy you see here in the wheelchair, to basically decide if he's going to let the Sandman go or not. And basically, he keeps pleading with the Sandman, please speak to me, speak to me and tell me you're not going to hurt us. And if you do that, we'll let you go. But the Sandman will not speak a word. This goes on for several more decades because this guy was a boy, turns into an old man with his same-sex partner, and refuses. the Sandman refuses to promise not to kill them. But then his partner basically feels sorry for the Sandman, and he breaks the circle. 
And this is how the Sandman escapes. Let me upstairs, Paul. I won't be coming down here again. So there's the circle on the floor and you can see the sigils. Now these sigils look, this particular sigil looks like a key. And that's very, very important because we've been talking a lot about keys, haven't we? He swipes the floor, breaks the, the golden circle, and this allows the Sandman to escape. Now as we get into aspects of this TV series, understand that there are biblical overtones in all of these series, in all these films. We're going to go over some of those today. We've already began to kind of break some of that down, and we will continue to do so as this goes through here. So he escapes. How does he escape? Of course, he escapes through a tornado-like portal. That's how he gets back to the dream world. Okay. Now these tornado-like portals are all throughout the Bible. The whirlwind that took up Elijah. Uh, also God manifested as a pillar. A pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. To the Israelites, pillars are portals. They're tornadoes. And there are many, many more uh, examples of this. I kept a journal for a while, some time after you left. So he gets back to the dream world. And at that point, they basically start talking about the library and books and basically people being books. Now, I'm only going to probably go into about two episodes of this because the whole alternative sexuality programming was through the roof in this. And it, I just, I can't get through more than probably the first two episodes. In fact, in, there's a trailer at the end of this first episode and there's a Transformer character introduced. So this, they're, they're coming at us with guns blazing with this agenda. Okay. And these are the kind of TV series that a lot of children watch. So they're programming all this. So, episode two opens with the library of time archetyped. Now, we've talked about the library of time. That time is basically depicted as a library. A library prison. Basically, we are all books on the shelves in our little places, cataloged, in a library where our life is like events written on pages books are generally the shape of a cube especially very thick books and so that is what we are we're in like a cubicle and our whole life is written down hopefully our names are written in the book of life but we've seen this explanation before of these of these uh of time and life being represented as a book in a library. Like in the film Interstellar. Where basically Matthew McConaughey was able to communicate through time and space. Back to his daughter who he left on Earth. Because as he started to travel through wormholes and stuff. Uh, time changed. And all the people that he knew and loved had basically died. And... So basically, he goes through a library, and that's how he communicates with her. Also in the film, The Giver. Many of you guys remember that. We decoded The Giver. And again, there was a library full of books. And I think there's another reference to in the film, The Umbrella Academy. Libraries and books represent lives and time. And of course, books are made of trees, and trees are people. We have limbs, a crown, we have a, uh, a core, a trunk. We set down roots, and we have family trees, don't we? Let's keep watching here. All the books in the library became bound volumes of blank paper. I never found it again. The next day, the whole library was gone. Cain! So then we get into these two characters. Cain and Abel. Literally, Cain and Abel show up in the series 
And here they're depicted as twins, which I believe is probably pretty accurate. But they were twins from different fathers. Born in the same womb, but of different fathers. Through a process called superfecundation. Superfecundation is where there is there are twins from two different fathers who are grow up in the same womb. It actually happens more often than you might think. Statistically, I think it happens like 0.5% of the time or something like that. In other words, a woman has relations with two different men within a very tight time period. Both make it into the womb, but they're from two different fathers. Now, here's where things go off the rails. Because before we get into how Cain and Abel are depicted in the TV series, The Sandman, I want you to look at these two family trees. Right next to each other, we have Cain's bloodline, which is mentioned separately in the Bible. There's no mistaking that. Cain's bloodline is mentioned separately from Adam's. Adam's bloodline is spelled out and then Cain's next to it. Of course, Abel was slain. Seth took his place. So we have Seth, which is under Adam, on this side. And we have Cain on this side. And now I want you to look at the two families next to each other. Because something really weird happens. There are duplicate names. Now we've studied this before, but it bears repeating. Especially given the fact that uh, it's mentioned in this TV series. Let me check in with you guys. And then we'll keep going with this. Now this concept right here. Is one of the most important concepts. Of all of the biblical research that we've done. And all the revelations that have been given to us. Why is this so important? It's important because. This is the original root cause of everything that's happening in the world right now. This is the enmity between the two seeds, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now watch this. I call this study biblical doppelgangers because literally every person in Seth's line has a name that corresponds to Cain's line. Now, how could this be? Now, I don't know who was born first. You can probably do that study for yourself and find out when each of these people was born in each of these bloodlines. But, and that would probably give us a clue as to why the names are similar and exact in many cases. Maybe one was copying the other. Maybe one's a counterpart, an evil counterpart of the other. The serpent trying to confuse the bloodlines. Now, let me say a couple other things about these two bloodlines before we get into the similarities between them. Abel's bloodline and Seth were required to provide a lamb for their sins. This practice continued only in Seth's bloodline. In other words, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, all the way down to the Israelites who are from the bloodline of Seth only were required to give the, the lamb a sacrifice. Cain's bloodline, on the other hand, and you can look up these bloodlines in the Bible. You can do the study yourself. I could show it to you, but it, you're better off learning it yourself. That way you know that I'm not making all this up. Cain's bloodline was not expected to provide a lamb for sacrifice. In fact, Cain's bloodline were farmers. And now you have a clue as to why God rejected Cain's offering. Because he didn't offer the lamb, he offered food. Now that I have your attention about the deeper meanings of the Bible that really no one's talking about, because they're just repeating old interpretations. Now I want you to look at the similar similarities between these names. 
we have an Enoch on Cain's side. We have an Enoch on Seth's side. Yes, there are two Enochs, a bad Enoch and a good Enoch. There is a Jared on Seth's side. There is an Erad on Cain's side. Very similar names. There is a Mahalalel on Seth's side. And there's a Mahujael on Cain's side. There's a Methuselah on Seth's side. And a Methusael on Cain's side. There's a Lemek on Cain's side. And a Lemek on Seth's side. Same exact name. There's a Canaan on Seth's side and a Cain, of course, on Cain's side. What else do we have? So, the only person that doesn't have a corresponding name, it looks like, is Enos. Probably an important person to look at. The only one that doesn't have a corresponding name on the Cain bloodline. Now, some people even argue that there were two Adas, Zillas, and Namas. And there may have been, which makes things very, very confusing, doesn't it? When we try to figure out how the giants leapfrogged over the flood. Who did, they have, did the fallen ones have relations with? What bloodline survived the flood? How did that possibly happen? Because we know there were giants after the flood. Because the Bible mentions that there were giants after the flood. There were giants in those days and after. The Bible says. And the giants are actually named after the flood. Og of Bashan was one of them. A king with a bedstand that was 13 feet long. There was also the giant Philistine was slayed by by David. There was also many, many more stories. There was a man from Gath with six fingers and six toes with a, a spearhead that was weighed five times the normal amount of shekels of a spear. Now, what is this all about, these mirrored bloodlines? Well, uh, do you think God's trying to tell you something? That there are two bloodlines? I think he really is. I think this proves it. And it also goes back to the dream realm. Now, originally I thought maybe each of us has like this inside of us that we have to fight with. Crouching at the door, so to speak. A, a spirit, like a twin spirit. And I don't know that. But that's what it kind of seems like, doesn't it? These bloodlines are mirroring each other. Now, let's get back to this Sandman and show you what they have to say about Cain. Because the Sandman visits Cain and Abel. Why? He comes back to retrieve his dragon. As you can see here, it's a little dragon. It's actually a gargoyle. But he needs to basically consume the dragon or the gargoyle so he can gain his energy back so he can restore the realm of dreaming watch this what do you want powder brain can you not see i'm busy we have visitors what Cain, abel lord morpheus so again his name is morpheus sandman is also morpheus now Here's where we get into, this is just crazy. I mean, I'm glad you guys were on me to decode this, but like I said, I've only made it through the first two episodes. I probably won't go further. Most of the concepts in these TV series reveal themselves within the first two episodes anyway, so I don't think we're going to be missing much. And unless there's a particular episode that you want me to look at, I probably will kind of leave the trail at this point. But look at this. Before the Sandman consumes the gargoyle, 
the dragon gargoyle is kicking around a soccer ball. This is the Acrino Drome, we call it on this channel, molecule. This is a soccer ball pattern. Soccer ball, Acrino Drome. Soccer ball, Acrino Drome. What's this about? Uh, well, the soccer ball represents an Acrino Drome molecule. It's got a hexagon and a pentagon pattern on it. A six and a five. So, what the Sandman is really doing here when he eats the gargoyle is he's consuming a Crino drone. <laughs> Surely there's another way. I wish there were, but the dreaming must be restored. The dreaming must be restored. Then Cain offers himself as a sacrifice or his brother instead, because they don't want to let go of their gargoyle. Or Abel. Yeah, take me, Lord Morpheus, please. I cannot. I can only reabsorb that which I created and Gregory began as a nightmare. Remember, the Ouroboros eats its tail. That's what you're seeing right now. Good luck, my lord. So, of course, Morpheus the Sandman consumes the cursed dust, and that is the foundation of the entire Bible. That when things are born out of the cursed dust, they die again. Because you can't make a cake with bad milk or it will spoil prematurely, right? So now you're starting to see the biblical overtones of this, of all of this. Everything that the, the, the devil does is biblically based to try to trick you. How can people not believe in the Bible at this point? When you have the devil trying to retell the story in a negative way to trick you. Why do that? Why make, if the devil made the Bible, why would he need to do all this to counter the Bible? It makes absolutely no sense. Lord. Simpering suck up. So, Satan is basically trapped in the cage of time until the end of time. And in this retelling, Cain and Abel are reunited. As if the first murder hadn't fathered Cain and made him kill his brother and the pure human bloodline of Adam. You see how he fell right there? Right in front of the soccer ball? In your absence, these waters have become darker, treacherous, unsafe. So there, there they're talking about the dark waters, right? Gregory's sacrifice will not be in vain. I have to focus. Open my eyes. The currents are stronger than... So obviously, open your eyes. This is the eye portals, right? The eye portals. Now let me back up a minute because I missed a couple parts back here about Cain because Cain likely ate his own brother. Okay. Cainabilism. Cainabilism. He likely was the first cannibal and he was likely the first one to like draw power off of blood. He was likely the first person who basically consumed a crinodrome. So. Then the Sandman basically realizes that he has to go to the Fates. He has to go to the Fates to basically ask them questions about where the rest of his tools are. So he can rebuild the Dream Realm. Now that he's got the power from the gargoyle that he ate, he can now approach the Fates. He can give them a gift and basically they will tell him where the rest of his tools are. So he can basically go back and rebuild the Dream Realm. And he has to basically offer a sacrifice 
through the dark waters. Now, this, is, of course, is also a topic we've been discussing at length long before this series released. The dark waters. Let's play that back again. Waters have become darker. Absence, these waters have become darker. Treacherous. Unsafe. Gregory's sacrifice will not be in vain. I have to focus. Now, it only gets more specific here. I mean, I was just shocked at how much they reveal in these kinds of TV series. Because after he passes through the eye portal, he finds a snake. Open my eyes. The currents are stronger and faster than I remember. Open your eyes. Eve ate of the fruit and her eyes were opened. And see what the fates require. A symbol of transformation. He calls the snake a symbol of transformation. Now, let's break down the snake. Because the snake and the eye are synonymous. What are you talking about, Casey? Well... The word O-P-H is the root word that also means snake. As well as anything pertaining to the eyes. This is the Orphic egg. Let me pull this up for you guys. This is the Orphic egg. Notice the O-P-H in the word Orphic. And it's basically a snake eating an egg, right? And this is representative of basically the Ouroboros' hold on time. In other words, because of the serpent and the sin, we have bad milk or bad dust making our cake, making us human. Reproduction through the bad dust means we die, right? And so this is a symbol of that. The snake's hold over the cursed dust until the end of time when God fixes all of it, right? And that's what this symbol really means. Now, now that you understand the connection between Orphic, OPH, and the serpent, now let's talk about the connection between the egg. Because, oh, I'm sorry, the eye. Because the word for that everything that surrounds the word I comes from the root word OP. Ophthalmologist. Right? So now you understand the connection between the serpent getting Eve to eat the apple and her eyes being opened. Basically, OPH means knowledge. It means your eyes are opened to knowledge. But what does that really mean? Well, it's not what you think it means. It means that Eve passed through a portal. Remember, eyes are portals. When her eyes are open, she entered into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what it really meant. OPH means knowledge. Serpent means knowledge. OPH means eyes. It's all the same. So, the word morphing has also the O-P-H in it. Metamorphosis, Morpheus, which is his name, the Sandman, it's all the same. It's about rebirth under the serpent or a boris of time, which means curse dust, which means you all die. We're trapped here. And this is why Jesus had to come and open another portal. The portal of life, the well of life, through him, through belief in him. We go through the narrow gate, which is a portal, back to him. Now, we don't literally go through a portal, but when he returns, we're already saved in him, aren't we? So now you see how the Bible makes so much more sense. It's not just a tale. It's not just a metaphor. It's not, it's real. And this is why, this is why there's sin in the world. This is why there's suffering. So, basically, at this point, the Sandman grabs his serpent to offer it as a sacrifice to the fates. 
as like a gift, but he keeps the egg that you see here and he gives it to Cain and Abel in return for taking Gregory away from them. Gregory was the name of their gargoyle. A serpent of life, death, and rebirth. Serpent. You may ask us three questions. And get one answer from each of us. One answer from each of us. Now, the reason why you see Abel still alive is because in the series, apparently Cain can just keep killing Abel over and over again every single day. And Abel keeps getting resurrected. Now, what could that mean? You guys, that's the realm we're trapped in. We keep dying and being reborn in subsequent generations. And we keep dying and reborn over and over and over again. Nothing new under the sun. Now, why is it? Here's what saddens me. The biblical patriarchs, Jesus followers, everybody already knew all this stuff I'm telling you. Why is it that we're having to basically figure the Bible out because the enemy is basically trying to trick us about the true nature of the Bible? Why, why are we having to figure out this all out through this instead of our own churches who are supposed to know all this? It's because the enemy has already co-opted the churches and hidden all this knowledge. Now, if he was now, people will say, Casey, you're learning this stuff through their stuff. Well, obviously, they're not teaching what I'm telling you and how we're interpreting all this. We're reading between the lines on this. In other words, if you were just to watch this, you wouldn't pull all of this out of out of here. You would be deceived with the rest of the people in thinking that the Bible is a fable and worshiping the serpent, feeling sympathy for the devil, because that's what happens here. They want you to feel sorry for the Sandman. So if you were just watching this, you would just start feeling bad for the Sandman and for time and the devil being trapped down here with us. But when you read between the lines, then you understand the truth, like what, what we're doing today. And at the end of this, the only question is, which portal will you choose? Will you choose the wide gate, the wide portal, or will you choose the narrow gate back to Jesus? It's a baby gargoyle. He can't help it. It's not his fault. It's who he is. It's who we are. The first murderer, the first victim. This is our story. Now, if you haven't already, it's time to give your life to Jesus. If it, you, it, it, Look, I don't get up and do this every day for my health. I don't get up every day because this makes me popular. This is a very tough road that I walk. My own Christian brothers and sisters attack me. Say this is Gnosticism or whatever they want to call it. They want to hide the truth. This is not an easy road, you guys. Very few people that you can even talk to about this stuff that can that understand it. Over and over and over again, they're making fun of Jesus. They're making fun of how many of these do you have to see before you realize that no other God with a little g is made fun of and mocked like Jesus is. Somebody mentioned the other day, oh, Allah gets mocked and how... The few times that that's happened, they send out their little assassins to kill the person, don't they? Allah is not mocked on a wide scale like Jesus is. Sorry, he's not. He's not. Jesus is the only one that they do that to. So that should tell you something right now. I know some of you are having an inner debate about this. Because I see you in the comments. You're not sure if you should give your life to Jesus. Or you think the Bible is written by Masons. Or you believe all the other lies that are told about this. I'm not here to hit you over the head with this. I'm here speaking out of compassion and love. For my brothers and sisters. Because he does not want to see any of us perish. Not one. 
But you have to take that step. And it doesn't mean going into a church. Find a fellow believer. You can do this in your bathtub. Go into the... Uh, probably better to go in the ocean because the bathtub is has all these occult roots to it, doesn't it? Go into the ocean or into a lake or in a stream like the Bible, like they said in the Bible, the Jordan River. Be baptized and give your life. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to start going on the road. Let's go into the chat here. Now God can make something good out of even the darkest TV series, can't he? Yes, he can. All right. Oh, man. All right. Yep. No need for a building. No need. All you need is a fellow believer. Somebody that you know that believes. And ask them to do it for you. And they would be glad to do it for you. It would be an honor. And repent. There's there's some other tenets to the gospel. But one thing it doesn't say is that you have to be perfect. Okay. We're all on this road of sanctification, aren't we? All right. You guys have any questions? We don't belong in the tree of good and evil. No, we do not. You are absolutely right. We believe we belong in the tree of life. That's where we belong. Wow, EBT has been down for days. Yes, I heard about that. I didn't know it was down for days, though. I just heard it was down yesterday. Apparently, it's down for days. Wow. That's them flexing their muscle. That's what they're doing. Creating fear. They give everyone a false sense of security. They say, oh, we live in the greatest country in the world. We have unemployment. We have EBT to take care of our people. And then they just simply turn it on and turn it off whenever they want. Just to mess with people's minds. The beast system. Now tomorrow we're probably going to do a headline show. Probably going to talk about some of the new developments. The Artemis rocket launch, some other things. So if you notice that the Artemis rocket looks like a a syringe with two boosters. Hmm. Uh, Artemis is the bringer of disease and cure. What could that mean? Hmm. There you go. They tell you right there. But few want to believe it. Few want to believe it. All right. Yep, they cancel your debit card whenever they want to. Some of you, some of you, it's working for some areas. Yeah, you cannot baptize yourself. That's not the example that was set before us. You, you really need to find a believer. Now. Um, heck, I don't know. Best to go by the Bible, right? Follow the example in the Bible. I mean, I wouldn't think that that God would really care, but you got to follow the example that's in the Bible. Gosh, there's so few of us left, true believers anyway. Uh, you know, if you were to go to a church and ask them to baptize you, they'd be all over you. To join the church or they would say, oh, we can't baptize you unless you join the church or something like that. I mean, I'm sure not all churches are like that, but I remember being a member of a church. And when I moved, they're like, oh, we're going to transfer your membership. I go, what do you mean you're going to transfer my membership? I don't want to be on some list. <laughs> That's for their 501c3 accounting. They have to make sure that they keep track of all the members. So, yeah, you know, I'm not here to debate whether or not you need somebody to just read your Bible and you 
figure out, you know, what the Bible says about baptism. And God will reveal the truth to you. Okay? All right. Okay, what else is going on in here? The thief on the cross was not baptized. Well, you could argue because he was a direct, he was saved directly by Jesus that maybe he was able to skip that step. But the rest of the New Testament says, be baptized, repent. And Jesus provided the example because he himself was baptized in the Jordan River. I think that's probably the safe bet. I mean, would you really want to leave that to chance? Would you really, when all you'd have to do is just call, pick up the phone and call somebody? Would you really want to be standing in front of Jesus and he said, you know what? You know, I gave you the example in the Bible, but uh, you wanted to kind of nitpick me and you just thought you could do it yourself. Would you really want to leave something, the most important moment in your life, up to chance and do it wrong? I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. I can tell you that. So. But it's up to you. Free choice. All right. What else is going on in here? All right. Okay, you guys. Well, I guess we'll end the show here. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow with Between the Headlines. Everything you heard today isn't from me. Don't worship me. Don't idolize me. You know, this. all of this comes from the Most High. This is These are inspirations of the Holy Spirit. And so that is where you should be focusing your love, adoration. Praise God that He's revealing these things to you. So here we go. Here we go. False gospel. Here comes the attacks. Nobody wants to believe the truth. Not nobody, most of you guys do, but there's always a couple in the group, right? So we're going to end the show there on a, on a, try to end it on a positive note and not allow the nitpickers to try to, you know, ruin the amazing revelations of the Holy Spirit that just happened on today's show. I love you guys and I hope you guys have a great day. Take care and be safe.